And every time when I was like, when I felt like I was going to die on the mountain, I was like, you know, not today. But when I first went for the selection, there were like 32,000 young men. And then next time we woke up was in Catrick. And I was like, is this really England? It's worse than Nepal. Nims, how are you, brother? I'm good, Chris. How are you doing? Yes, wonderful. As I was saying before, one day we can meet in Nepal and uh, do some climbing on, and, and uh, we won't have to speak over zoom but yeah you know. hey hey well we're adapting and you know hopefully next year my man yeah this is positive <laughs> i'm sure yeah so i want to stand on the uh the top of mount everest with you hey we're gonna make it happen buddy we're gonna make it happen yeah it's chomolonga is yeah, that right it's chomolonga and also uh, sagarmatha as well so yeah yes I mean, Westerners, eh? They ru ruin everything. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> you know, there are some of the words in English that you know, I cannot pronounce as well, so it's all right. <laughs> yes. Well, let me just start by saying um, I've just read your book, just finished it 10 minutes ago. Oh, oh. <laughs> I can't be speechless because I have to say something. What I would say is what an amazing read written by an amazing man. It, it was just absolutely great. Wow. Um, I'm not just saying this. I read lots of books. Here is my some, some of my mountain books. <laughs> Jesus. Um, oh, my God. Yes. I, I, I love to live vicariously through other people's adventures when I'm not doing my own adventures, right? I just, I think it's the best way to live. You, your whole story from beginning till now, obviously it's not the end and, and it, it, it's, it's just everything I try and teach my, my young people that watch the podcast, you know, dream, dream big, believe in yourself. Don't listen to the naysayers because that's almost everybody these days, right? Yeah. And smash your goals. And, and, and once you start smashing them, you don't, you don't stop until you've completed. And such a well-written book, so exciting. It's, they say page turner, and, you know, that's e an easy word to say, but it really was just, you know, you, ca you cannot put this book down, folks. Please believe me. Uh, sorry I'm talking a lot but it's I've got a lot to say that your character is is just such a shining example Nims um, such a good representation of the the British forces especially our elite elite forces uh, such a uh, credibility to, to Nepal and the Gurkhas and as I always say it's uh, better better to die than be a coward yeah thank you chris you know wow it's a it's a really you know humbling you know um i would say acknowledgement and, and comments from you buddy and um yeah and then as you know chris in everything what i do in life i give 100 percent. and and believe it or not you know writing this book was definitely one of the hardest thing i have ever done i'm not sure if i'm gonna write another book um if i'm honest because you know, when you write something, it becomes black and white. Then it becomes, you know, it's a concrete. And, um, you know, to write this amount of, you know, enormous book from, you know, you know, up to this stage. And it's kind of, you know, like, I wouldn't say my, you know, it's my autobiography, but it's almost that. So covering from, you know, how I grew up, you know, in a very, you know, small, humbling background with almost nothing, you know, 
to joining into the Gaikas, you know, failing in a first attempt and making it happen, obviously. Uh, and then even going into the special forces and, you know, and then serving, you know, with the elite forces for 10 years and then resigning everything when, you know, I had better offer from, you know, like even my, our friends from SAS and all that and, and just to leave completely what I had and, and to go, you know, and, and do different, you know, completely different thing. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to do a justice, you know, to, to the story. And every time when I was like, when I felt like I was going to die on the mountain, I was like, you know, not today. Because I didn't want it, anybody to tell my story because that would never be fair. And, you know, as I keep saying, there are so many layers um, that I wanted to represent from, from this book and wanted to, you know, you know, bring the justice to, to so many you know, inequality and all that that has been in the past. And also like to, to inspire the, the younger generation about, you know, and how much you can push and what you can achieve if you truly believe in yourself and you, if, if you put your heart, mind and soul into it. So it was really hard, um, Chris, I must say, you know, you know for the last, you know, uh, almost 10 months, um, I've been working really hard with, you know, obviously Matt, uh, who helped me to write this book. And it's been non-stop. And um, yeah, I'm glad it's out. Um, and I'm really excited rather than being nervous, you know, when, when the something, you know, of this significance comes out, you know, generally people are nervous as well uh, because you don't know, but, you know, I'm very confident because I, you know, I get 100% and, and I couldn't give on any more. And everything what, you know, what I have written on the book is, uh, is, is a statement, you know, Everything is backed up by evidence. No one can argue that. So, and hey, we have it's a big job. So it's, it's really like down to earth, black and white, um, honest and fair, um, you know, kind of, you know, story. Yes, and it comes across that way. I think I'm, I'm, on, I'm on my sixth book now. It's my, uh, the one I'm finishing now is my third memoir. And when you write your first one, yeah, you're, it's, it's, it's a, you put every it's like having a baby you put yeah. ev everything in you're honest and you're opening yourself up and but here's the thing you're not writing for the naysayers that are always yeah. just they're just going to be negative because they're not happy in their lives right you're writing for the people whose lives you're going to change right yeah. and Percent. They always say you only need a thousand people that believe in you to make a career, you know, to, to keep your career going. And that's, you're not, the, the, you, you're not going to hit with everyone. And yeah, after um, like your third book, you just, you don't even look at the reviews anymore because it, <laughs> it, it doesn't, you know, you're going to get people that says, Oh, he spelt this wrong. Or, you know, yeah. he said this and, and, and it's yeah. just the way, it's the way life with a keyboard has, has become, but you, you put your money where your mouth is. You did what you set out to do. Your book is an honest account of that. And, and like all good memoirs, you've talked about your, uh, your human side. I don't want to say weakness because, <laughs> you know, it's not the right word, but your human side and people are going to love that. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, like it was such a, with one book to, to write such a huge story. Um, and, you know, we're running out of force and we had to condense, you know, some of the, of, of, of the, you know, part of the story, but I think it's, it's very punchy and it will take you to the summit and, you know, bring it down deep into the ocean and, uh, everything is a roller coaster because my whole life was a roller coaster. It's written so well. I love the way you didn't go too much detail on every peak because it would have just become da 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 yeah you know you're 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 obviously had a good e editor i'm i'm assuming um because yeah. that's, that's a real real skill it takes many years to learn that in itself but also because what i didn't want to write is is just the book about the mountain you know if people want to read the the let's say for example just on Everest you know like standing at 1848 meters and all that then there's Wikipedia there's like hundreds of books what I wanted to write about is about my experience you know of course the challenges and how people can relate that challenge in their own life and how can they achieve their new possible 
you know, every there's of course there will be like there is a problem in life. We all have problems, and there will be a problem when you climb these big mountains. But every problem has a solution, you yeah. know. And then I think once people take that kind of an approach and and all that, um, you know, I hope you know a lot of people will will get of it in at least few stuff from this book. I love the way as well. It's it's one of the only uh, mountain memoirs. There is another. <laughs> there's there's one more here, which is quite yes. a. This is quite a sad book by Maria uh, Coffey, who loves, lost her husband on the, or her boyfriend on the mountains. And that is the only other book I read that talks about all the partying that goes on. And <laughs> for our friends at home, this man is drinking all night um, and then climbing an 8,000 peak literally run, running up it the next day and and i i really love that i, I just loved it i loved the, the way you just smashed it yeah the, the biggest thing is like you know of course i'm not like you know promoting you know alcohol but you know like it's just about being happy a bit of you know celebration you know of, like just to give an example like you know i opened the route for everybody else on k2 with my team got back down you know no sleep at all you know, obviously, it was a massive celebration because, you know, people were so happy and, and thankful for for me and my team because we opened the route for everybody else. And I had even changed my plan for for the people out there because I wanted to go and climb Broad Peak first. But when I found out the expectation from people and the hope from the people was I would open the route for K2, um, I just didn't want it to let their hope down because, you know, hope is such a, such a big word. And I keep saying in the book that hope is a god. So, yeah, I changed my plan, did all this stuff in a massive celebration in, in, in the base camp. I probably had like in a three hours rest in whole of like, I would say, three days uh, plus. And then yeah, I went to the summit of Broad Peak, but it was epic, you know, where in our oxygen ran out, you know, we were kind of lost on the mountains. And uh, it's, it's great to be, uh, well, as I keep saying, you know, there were so many points where, you know, I thought I was going to die. And um Obviously, I'm not in a dead. I'm alive and, and happy to be covering those stories in details and how I box those problem as I obviously, you know, go and, and, and face these challenges. So I'm sure the readers would, uh, would find that quite interesting, um, Chris. Nims, you stopped to rescue people in the death zone when the, the rest of their team had had. had left them I'm, and, and i don't say that as a bad thing i i i haven't yeah. been up there but i can fully appreciate it's life and death and you're exhausted and is someone struggling for the for the average averagely good climber you've got to save your life and get down but but you actually stopped and you're on the radio you're calling to bait to the camps below to can you get more oxygen up to us and and you saved lives and you, you even carried one gentleman down. He was so ill that he yeah. died as you were ca carrying him down. It, oh. Yeah, my, and, and as you know, and I came from, you know, the, the Gurkha, you know, the British Gurkha background and UK Special Forces background, you know. We have never left anyone behind in the war and I wasn't certainly not going to do on the mountain, you know, of course. So, yeah, and it's good to keep that, you know, kind of an ethos and principle values, um, you know, that, you know, I learned from, you know, from my life with the British forces, because, you know, I spent majority of my life with the, with the British military, then that's who I am. And of course, I'm now taking into completely different endeavor and all that. But, you know, and that's why, you know, when people say, you know, Nims, who are you? Give me a sentence. I say, okay, I'm, I'm Nims Dai, I'm born in Nepal, but I was raised in, in, in the British military. Well, then I became pretty much, can I say, badass on the big mountains, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah don't take that too seriously. But yeah, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be. <laughs> yeah. It's a dream, isn't it, of <laughs> many young young men in Nepal is to, to join the Gurkhas. It, it's mm -hmm. historic. I yeah. only realized reading your book that there's actually three Gurkha regiments in different countries. Yeah. That is my, and, and it's, it's a huge selection. Like, for example, when I first went for the selection, there were like 
32,000 young men, you know, trying to obviously, you know, go for the, for the recruitment. And only 320 made it. You know, no wonder why I fell on the first attempt, obviously. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. But hey, you know, like, yeah, but made it on the second attempt. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really tough challenge. Um, and you, you got to obviously, you know, quite, um, you know, educated as well, because they do really, you know, tough tests on English, maths and science. There's a physical test, there's a medical test, you know, all sorts of tests. So, yeah. There was an article, Nims, I read, oh my gosh, we're talking about 30 years ago now. So back when I was joined the Marines, uh, it, it was an article about the recruitment process up in the Himalayas before the modern day where now you have, you know, recruiting stations and this. Yeah. And back then a guy would like walk around the villages <laughs> yeah. you know offering the opportunity to the young men they would then turn up at some outpost in the middle of nowhere they had yeah. to be a certain weight they had to have all their teeth checked and all this oh yeah massively massively yeah. Mate. you know you need to have like perfect you know line teeth and you know um yeah everything get checked you know you cannot look ugly as well apparently <laughs> <laughs> that's how, how did you pass their names? Oh, man, I don't know. Tell me about it. <laughs> is, that, is that a big thing? Because one of the best times in my life, one of the, the best course I have ever done was the British Power Course. And uh, I did actually did one and a half of them because the first one I did was cancelled halfway through because of the, the first Gulf War. Um. And spending time with the Gurkhas is, was just magical. They <laughs> love to disco dance. It was just incredible. All over the floor. <laughs> and they were so kind, so humble. Um, yeah, it was very special. But I could fully appreciate, especially now as I've traveled the whole world many, many times, that the difference in culture for a young man from the mountains to suddenly be put in the British military and just like trying to understand the military sense of humour must be... Oh, mate, it's massive. And imagine, Chris, like, you know, um, well, when I first, like, joined the guy, because, you know, obviously you, you think of England. As soon as you think of England, you think of, in you know, a big band, you know, like London Eye in the Buckingham Palace and all that. And... Um, Obviously, past the slicks, and I thought I was going to see that. And I landed at London Heathrow, and uh, it was raining sideways. And we were like put into the coach, and then we drove like hours and hours. And 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 next time we woke up was in Catrick, and I was like, "Is this really England? It's worse than Nepal." <laughs> it was, and and, and you know, like, and and I was meetings obviously, you know, it's, it's up in north, so. I went to boarding the school, so I thought, you know, my English was really good and all that amongst, obviously, the, the Nepalese community and all that, at least. So I tried to have this dialogue with, with this, obviously, in you know, a British counterpart. Jesus Christ, I had no idea what he was saying. And, and of course, he was, you know, like a Scottish lad, which I figured out later on, you know, down the career. And I was like, what school did I went to? What did I learn? I can't even like speak to this guy. So you know, like you know, even covering you know, those kind of you know, like really minor but important details of of how kind of you know, like challenging it can be as a Gurkha to 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 fit in the Gurkha as a Nepalese, then to fit within the UK Special Forces. And because you know, when you join special forces, you cannot have any witness. You cannot be like, "Oh, he's a he's a Gurkha," or you can be this and that. No, you need to have that special forces standard, and mm -hmm. and to be able to operate and to be able to meet that correct area, and it's it's not easy. It's not easy. Oh, um, you know, I, I have to work twice harder for sure. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to say that's easy. So, Nims, were you the first Gurkha to join? The special boat service oh mate yeah yeah mate you, um, made it met the cut i would say <laughs> congratulations what what a great accolade to have for the the rest of your life oh mate thank you so much and you know you know and the reason why i joined the sbs was and i worked with the marines in in afghanistan in in Herik seven when i was serving the Gurkhas. 
And, you know, they were so humble. They were really, you know, one of the finest souls that I have worked with. And, um, but then they were like so nice. And, you know, and the kind of like Gurkha ethos kind of fitted with them um, rather than, you know, being, you know, full on, you know, yourself and all that, you know, of course, you know, you, you, you do have some of the regimen within the military. But of course, that, all, that is also good in their perspective. But it's about recognizing who you are and where do you fit? And for me, I wanted to, to obviously, you know, go into into SBS, and I kind of knew that, you know, there's a diving aspect of the um, of the, uh, you know, of the job as well, and I was kind of gonna make it even more challenging. So, yeah. Was it difficult? Um, because I only learned to swim when I when I say swim, I mean swim properly. Because obviously, <laughs> to join to join the commandos, you've got to be able to pass the swimming test and the falling off the diving board in all, all your yeah. equipment, right? And I scraped through that, but I only really taught myself properly how to swim when I was 48, 47. Yeah. In fact, I started at 46 and I could swim one length of the swimming pool and then I had to stop and hold on and, and yeah. breathe so I wouldn't drown. Within two years, because I set my goal on triathlon, I was doing quadruple Ironman, so four four Ironmen like in one go. Yeah. So that's a ten, well, n- nine mile swim, right? Ooh. But but even still, I'm if I stop for one split second, I'm just sinking, right? <laughs> was that difficult for you coming coming from a landlocked country? Yeah, of course, you know, it, it was tough, you know, buddy. But as I say, you know, like if you put, if you really want that, you know, there's nothing such as impossible, you know, from not knowing how to swim, you know, I started, you know, training for it. And um, and then one of my training resigned, you know, before I went for the selection for the SBS was I used to wake up really early in the morning, two o'clock, carry, you know, like 75 pounds to, you know, like, and then do like 20, you know, kilometer tab, do normal day military work. Um, and in the evening, I would just do like, you know, free runs. I drop my, obviously, back in you know, a Bergen and all that and run back. Then I used to go for swimming, which I used to do like, and I eventually managed to do like, you know, freestyle, like 100 meter, 100 lengths in 25 meter length. Uh, but it was tough to get over there. But hey, you know, there's nothing. And if you put your heart, mind and soul, you, you can obviously you know, achieve that. So, yeah. But of course, you know, coming from landlocked country, you know, only I know how much, you know, dedicated um, and how much you know hours and in you know, a commitment uh, and positive mindset I need to have in order to uh, accomplish that so yeah were you okay with the diving because I've done I've done um, a fair bit of diving I've, I've, I've been very lucky I've been on an expedition to Antarctica yeah. and dived on icebergs and that kind of thing I mean, but- Chris, it's, it's, it's this way. I, I'm still like that with it, though. You know, in in a in a dry suit, I found it re- really hard. The buoyancy. Yeah, yeah, let's put it this way: you know, if you are carrying about like you know 32 kg with full weapon, you know, all you know mags, everything, and then you know you're swimming at night, you know, three kilometers, you know, in in January and in December at night. Oh, uh, you must be pretty mad if you say you super love it. But I, I didn't complain about it. I should say that. <laughs> I no complain, but yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about Everest. And I'm, I'm just going to, I'm not going to apologize here to people because I know it's very cliche that if you're a tourist, you climb Everest. If you're a mountain climber, you climb the other more challenging peaks like K2, Annapurna, et cetera. Right? I, I completely I get that, right? But me, I grew up with uh, Chris Bonington, one of my books here. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the north face of Everest was just the biggest challenge back in the day. Um, I've obviously watched everything I can on Discovery Channel about, about climbing this mountain. And, and yeah, it is, it's a dream of mine. And I, wow. I do, I do but- kind of... I think, you know, definitely, you know, we're going to make your dream come true. Um, so we're having, having a chat here. Um, you know, I would, you know, the, the, the best thing, you know, first thing first, you just said that people call Everest is a tourist mountain and all that. I completely disagree. 
I had a meeting with Ryan Holmes now, you know, the guy who climbed all the 14 peak without supplementary oxygen. You know, back in the day, he's still legend. He is the legend. And um, we had a chat and he asked me, Nims, what do you think is the hardest mountain to climb in a thousand years? And I said, if you remove all the manpower, like, you know, everything, and if you have to just climb on your own, Everest will be the hardest. You cannot even get through the Kumbu Icefall. So it's not easy mountain. Everest become a bit easier because there are like a lot of, you know, like Sherpas, you know, working over there, but it's still 9,000 meters, buddy. And I know, you know, people just complain from the decks, you know, you, they have never been on the, on the, on the death zone. It's easy to say that, but waking up, you know, like, well, even climatizing for one month, you know, where your like head is pounding and every day is a struggle. And then, you know, as soon as you, you, you leave the base camp, you have to climb through this dangerous but beautiful in a Kumbu Icefall. And after that, then you got to climb this Botse wall, which is like 55 degrees. And then you go to like in a camp for, and then there's another like thousand meters. So it's not easy. And, and if people are saying that, just ask them, have you climbed it first? Yeah. And if they say yes, then yeah, you can comment. But if you haven't, then don't, you know, be that person. Don't be that person, guys. You know, if you haven't been in that shoes, don't complain. All right. So but to be honest, now going back into your dream, you know, Yes, and obviously through years of, you know, like training and, and obviously developing this high altitude stuff. Uh, I have a guiding company called, you know, Elite Expert. And uh, what you can do is, mate, you know, we can definitely help you. You know, we will train you at 6,000 meter first, 7,000. Um, and then we'll take you to one 8,000 meter peak and then Everest. But all this can be achieved if you got like uh, a bit of money and time um, can be achieved in two years. But in two years, you can just probably have to dedicate around four months of your life. And, and, and that can be achieved through a bespoke training and all that. Um, so, yeah. Good. Yes, I think it's the, the climbing snobbery, isn't it? Like in, in all sports, um, people resent the fact that there's people like me. I just want to climb Everest. Um, I, I, I understand mountaineering is beautiful. It's a great sport. I, I get to be in the mountains and appreciate the environment and the people that you, I, I get all of that, but I just have a goal to climb Everest. <laughs> and Yeah. And also Chris, and everybody has got, you know, their own strength and weakness. For example, I cannot be as good as like Sir Albert Einstein. I cannot be like him, but then let's say, for example, if like a person like him wants to climb Everest, What's wrong with climbing Everest with a, with, with a little help from somebody else who has got the experience? Because every human cannot be good at everything, you know? But it's the experience that you are learning in life and everybody gains something from the adventure. Everybody gains something from the challenge, from the endeavor. So it's, it's a different way of approach, I guess. Mm. You know, and then if you are trying to be the best mountaineer in the world, then then it is a different thing. But if you want to have that experience and if you are climbing for your personal challenge, if you are trying to raise, you know, money for the charity by taking your personal challenge and endeavor, of course, it's, it's a good thing. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not here to educate everybody else, but I have been in this 8,000 meter peak. You know, that's, that's my home ground. That's where I'm most alive. You know, no one can even argue that. So... Coming from that perspective, I can definitely have that say. So, yeah. Hey, and thank you for your offer. That's good. <laughs> I'm one step closer now. That's amazing. <laughs> it's um. You mentioned um, Reinhold Messner, and uh, his partner was Peter Harbler, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And I met him in um, Meyerhofen in Austria. He's got a, a ski school there. So, wow. Uh, yes. Where, yeah, well, yeah. these if people were legends, weren't they? They they climbed Everest when without oxygen, when yeah, nobody thought it was possible. Yeah, exactly. So you know, like um, I had a really good chat with Ryan Hall, and uh, he was very positive, and he was like, you know, when everybody said that in terms of mountaining, well, those people who knew how difficult it is to climb big mountains, they were like, oh, it's it's not possible, it's not happen. But then. When we had a chat at Nanga Purbat Base Camp, I think he see that fire in me and how much like I'm going for it. And he's like, you're crazy, man. I think, you know, Nims, it's possible you can do it. 
And he said, maybe even though if you do it in a year, it's good. I said, no, Rhino, the, the mission is 14 picks, seven months. And if I pass that one day by seven months, I felt my mission is like, you are in the Gaka military. We, we had a great conversation. He is a really nice person. Yes, good. Well, they say it takes one to know one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and your approach, um, th there's two different kind of approaches to climbing a mountain like Everest, aren't there? There's the one is you pay um, quite a lot of money to join one of the guiding companies. They provide your equipment. They'll do your training. Um, yeah. Then you, you go up to camp one camp two back to camp one maybe back to base camp and and or there's what you did um your first time which is just rock up there hire the equipment that you haven't brought from home go up on your own did you have one sherpa with you the first yeah time? I, I, I had, I had a, yeah climbing go climbing. up with your sherpa come down once for the acclimatization and then bang, cl climb the whole thing in, in, in pretty much one go. <laughs> yeah, the only thing with that is, Chris, you know, like for me, I, I knew my body really well. And, um, you know, of course, I think I have got some sort of, um, even though I didn't grow up in high altitude, I grew up almost at, you know, 500 meters. And that is even, you know, less than the height of, you know, a place like Samani and all that. So, yeah, but uh, somehow, but I have been trained by the best and all that. So, yeah, um, I am a speed climber. I'm a speed and endurance climber. So I do have a bit of, you know, those. Um, and I'm just trying to maximize that, you know, potential. Um, yeah. Yeah, so for our friends at home, NIMS has this um, amazing ability to almost charge, well, to charge up the mountains. And if you know anything about mountain sickness, um, the pulmonary edema and, and, and these kind of horrible, yeah. horrible conditions that can affect your brain and, and, and your lungs um, to be avoided at all costs. And, and they tend to affect pretty much most climbers at, 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 um, at one stage. Mm -hmm. Nims has the body that um, and the conditioning that he can kind of surpass that to, to a degree. Obviously, we're all, we're all human. Yeah, um, we are human. And Chris, just to say that you know, I also had in you know, a pulmonary edema uh, before. I suffered that in you know, a massively as well. So yeah, it's just about you know just just to all the you know, people who are listening. This is the biggest thing about high altitude mountaineering or any endeavor is about knowing your own body and how you maximize that. You know, so for example, sometimes let let me give an example. You are like you know hiking up to this in you know, a high altitude. And if you just push that, because you can push, you can just climb a bit extra harder, but then you don't have the knowledge and you don't know that your body well, then by, keep, by pushing that extra few hours and slipping at that altitude rather than stopping and, and assessing, that couple of hours can change the whole dynamic. So if you feel like that, you should stop. And then you could be only one day late. But then if you push that in a couple of hours and then you mess that up, you're going to have pulmonary edema or cerebral edema then you're going to have to evacuate from the mountain and and then there's no medications that are going to cure this you have to get off the altitude so it's all about you know knowing your body in depth and and how you use that to to the best advantage for the mission that you're going it and it's it's with every sport i guess uh, mastering your your body by yourself and then using that knowledge to you know to attack the mission i i would say yeah and then, and then and sorry, Chris, and, and, and the biggest thing here where you kind of, you know, put that as a baseline is do not compete with anybody else. If you just try to be best and if you try to compete, you know, be better than who you are yesterday, then you are in your own momentum. You are in your own rhythm. You are in your own pace. And then you you do so much better if you, if, if you take that approach. Um, so, yeah, try that, guys, if, if you haven't already. But hey, hey. Did you, you must have saved yourself a lot of um, m money or, or funding, as it's referred to, by taking that kind of guerrilla approach. Um, no, no, man. You know, like it was really tough because um, it was kind of, you know, 
a plan that or, or a vision at that point or in an imagination at that point where nobody believed it. So just to give you an example, three months prior, I left, you know, um, England for Nepal. Three months, I, I didn't have anything. But, but by the time I flew from London Heathrow, I only had 5% of the funding. And that's me, including putting the money from my house, from remortgaging and all that. So it was a really tough challenge, but what I was really sure was, as I keep climbing this mountain, as they style in a style that I have said I would climb them, in a way I would climb them. Um, I was kind of, you know, like optimistic that, you know, people will support and it will take only, you know, a million people to give one pound. And I had that vision and I, I, I didn't like, you know, let that get away. And uh, Slowly, as soon as I went to Annapurna, opened the route for everybody else, uh, then obviously did the rescue. Um, and I think people started, you know, knowing about the endeavor and all that. And um, yeah, I call this project as a people's project from, from every level because, you know, later on, obviously the big sponsors started coming in and all that. But mostly also, you know, like it was through the crowdfunding. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a massive endeavor. Um, in, in all level. Yeah, I think if you go back in the old days, so say the 60s and, and 70s, where people were first climbing these very high peaks, back then, for the people at home watching it in, or reading it in the newspapers, because obviously it's at the very early days of television, it was about king and country and, and, and this. <laughs> yeah. Now... I think for people, it's about seeing somebody do something that they don't feel that they can do. You know, we, we have this, you know, this Xbox culture. Yeah. If we don't get out and live our dream. We sit inside playing our dream on an electronic game. And when we see someone like you, Nims, it's like, wow, it, 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 there's something there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the, the first one, what you said was I really liked it, man. And nowadays we are in this time, in this era, uh, particularly. It's not about in a country and all that. It's about the people. It's about how we connect the people, how we do, you know, together to to survive and then to pass the positive message across and all that. So, yeah, and, and it's, it's, it was really nice to... You know, and the second point you mentioned was, you know, these days, obviously, you know, a lot of our younger generation is stay at home and then they get into this like computer game and all that. Um, yeah, but, you know, of course, you know, like the, the the classic example is there's there's a massive mountain. There's like great, you know, climbing outside and people people still go to indoor wall because they don't want to be wait or etc. cetera. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all good, but, you know, everybody has got their own choice and all that, and I'm not here to say what you should be doing and all that, but it's about, you know, thinking from the broader perspective and, um, you know, because the outdoor, the adventure, it gives you something that nothing can give you. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing playground. You learn so much just being outdoor. It's so good for your mind, for your mind. It's so good for your health. Because, you know, when you see the nature, nature just heals everything. So, yeah. Mm. And you, I guess, um, what one benefit of the social media generation is your, your Instagram picked up a lot of support, didn't it? Yeah, obviously, you know, at the start of, you know, 2019, I didn't even know how to use Instagram and all that. And um, yeah, it kind of started picking up and all. Uh, yeah, and then it's re really, you know, glad to be, you know, having that a bit of, you know, I wouldn't say influential power because I, I'm, I don't think I'm at that level yet, but being able to tell my story and, and fight for the cause, you know, and have, and have that voice to, to, to speak to the people. Um, because in, at the end of the day, I know myself, you know, for me, the biggest thing, money never buys me. It doesn't. That's not my agenda. If, if money was my priority, uh, guys, I would have never left in you know, SBS when you know sacrificing almost a million you know in dollar worth of pension, and I wouldn't have certainly rejected the offer from you know like you know our, our friends you know of the road, 
um, and all that. And then if you check out, and I'm not that kind of person. So I know for myself, I'm true. I'm, I'm all about being fairness. I'm all about being you know, honest and all that. So at least I have that. And then people cannot you know, you know, buy that from me. And, and I'm, I'm a pure soul. I am a, a true guy. So being able to, to be able to represent, you know, you know, not only myself for those people around in the world where, you know, where I cannot be bought by money and all that. I think it's a really great power to have, buddy. Um, you're, being so, very, yeah. you're being very humble, Nims. You should, we should tell people that you were asked to join the SAS. I mean, come on. <laughs> That's... How many people get asked? Most people have to prove themselves. I know, I know you had already done that, but it's um, that is quite a quite some story. But you know, I came from. I mean, it's not only about me, as I keep saying. And you know, for me, whatever I do in military or wherever, you know, it it, it affects the bigger group. I came from the Gaika. The Gaikas are known for you know being bravest, being loyal. You know, and you know I. It wasn't only about me, Chris, you know, and I'm not that kind of a person. So I have to think for the bigger picture and all that. So, yeah, if it doesn't, you know, even if, uh, even though we all are, um, we all operate under the umbrella of, you know, Her Majesty the Queen, um, you know, British Armed Forces. But it's still, you know, under that there is a layer. And, you know, if I can't have that, you know, my my personal integrity um i don't think you know i can be i can be talking about bigger things so yeah mm. i'm i'm guessing you still have your kukri like is that that's with you for life right yeah man i have it i got you know like couple here <laughs> i have it like you get you get you know you get one given when you passed out with the gaikas and all that so and yeah I watched, the, there's a great documentary on YouTube for anyone that I suggest everyone watches it. It's about the guy in, I'm, I'm guessing Kathmandu, He's, he makes the kukuris. Yeah. It, and they're, they're all made individually. It's not like in a factory or something. It, they're all handmade. Yeah, I think um, guys, take that link if you, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Are they, are they a good knife on the... The, but they, it, they are awesome. They're amazing knife, you know, and then that's why, you know, we have a, a massive history with, with cookery and all that. And um, yeah, it, it is, you know, it, it can be used for so many purposes, obviously. Um, yeah. Yes. Enough said about that because, uh, yeah. <laughs> we don't want to go into detail. Yes. Yes. Um, should we say, should we mention some of your sponsors' names? Because I, I know that is such a difficult thing to raise the money. Yeah, I know what it's like because I approached Richard Branson just like you did. Um, <laughs> I, I I did one better than you. He he actually wrote back to me or his second. Really? Did. Yeah. Oh my God! How come I didn't even get the response? And it was like proper handwritten, and it yeah. was like in a sealed as well properly. Um, so because I had loads of sponsors and all, so I'm just gonna like quickly go go and obviously you know you know tell them all because you know. It's not right to give you know one credits and 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 not to others. So yeah, you know, like so many like you know, sponsors obviously came into this one and 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 people supported. You know, the partners were like Bremon, you know, Selkso, Osprey, you know, Digital, and Ann Middleton, who is a great friend. Mm -hmm. And then to be fair, mate, you know, you know, he's one of the sponsor who just you know who didn't ask for anything else. Um, yeah. you know, he just, you know, sponsored the money and he's like, yeah, brother, you know, there you go. I really want you to do well. And I really want you to smash this project. I don't want you to do anything. Instagram post. I didn't want you to say anything. So I think that's what true sponsorship is. Um, so yeah. And so I select so, but yeah, I got like, you know, really good, um, all the sponsorship from, you know, Summit Oxygen, you know, Elite Himalayan Adventures. And there were so many like, um, Kit as well, where I got from Inmarsat. You know, that's where I was, you know, using the, the internet and all. Uh, we got Hamai Still, Through Dark, the gear that I use, you know, designed by, you know, our Special Forces brother, uh, branding signs. I mean, the list goes on, you know, yeah. And then, you know, a lot of also funding came from the crowdfunding, from the normal people. Um, so, yeah, massive thanks to everybody else, you know. Um, it's not the size of money you get, guys. It's about, you know, what, 
you felt that you could afford to give and you gave it from your heart. So thank you. Yes. Yes. Really well done, everybody. Was it hard? Your dream is coming true. You're clearly going to nail these peaks in seven months. But of course, you couldn't get um, permission for Shisha, Shisha Pangma. Yeah. That was in China. And that was obviously a big political, you know, this is where politics comes in, right? Yeah. What, I know you're a man that takes one day at a time, but that must have played on your mind a bit. Oh, massively. And I knew that my first application was rejected when I was on K2 before opening the, the lines for everybody else, you know. But you know, I had, you know, problems like that, you know, more than, you know, like I would say, you know, hundreds of problems like that, you know. So I kind of rebox it, um, you know. But, you know, when I came to that stage, you know, I also have loads of connections in Nepal, loads of friends. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, you know, kind of wanted it from their heart as well. And, and a lot of, you know, like friends from all over the world, you know, when I said I, I almost gave up, they also wrote a letter to, you know, the, the, the Chinese authorities. And that's when it really becomes people's project because everybody wanted me to, to, to complete that. So, yeah, it was really humbling to see, you know, people from all over the world, you know, kind of, you know, like wanting, you know, to, to see this completed. So it, it was really good. Yes. I think we should mention, um, and you mentioned this in your book, Nims, that because you were a Nepalese climber, you didn't get the focus. And I know you don't want the attention. I, 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 really, I really get that. But the funding that, that would have come with the media would have been handy, right? Would have yeah, taken, yeah. taken yeah. the pressure off. Yeah, you, you are absolutely right, buddy. And, and, and there's no lying in that uh, because it is, a, it, is, it is a bitter truth. It is, you know, and for a fact, if I was, you know, any, any Western, you know, climber or if it was any European and all that, I would, you know, it, it was even just sad to say one of the sponsors who could support it means like, and Nims, you didn't get any sponsorship because, you know, are you because you are brown? Uh, but I was like, yeah, that 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 is a brutal honesty. But I didn't, you know, I didn't let that, you know, you know, get into me. Um, and but he was honest, and and I don't know, man. But uh, for sure, if it was done by any other people, it would have been, you know, bigger than how it is. Um, and uh, of course, that would help for the sponsorship and all that. But hey, hey, it's, it's all right. Um, we always think positive. At least, you know, we get it done. Um, Job is done. We good. Um, you know, always give hundred percent, and it's still positive. So, yeah. So, congratulations on your MBE. <laughs> yeah. That's, um, I bet when you were a, a child in Nepal, you never expected that one. Nah, no, nah, buddy. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. And, um, and that was um, that was for the rescue I did in 2016, and um, you know, saving the Gurkha expedition from failure in 2017. I still need to go and pick it up, buddy. Yes, you're, you're a natural uh, decision maker and leader, aren't you? you uh, when, you're, when you're on in situations like on the mountain, a, a lot of leaders just fall apart. <clears throat> they, they don't have that, that, the thing in their heart, do they? You know, they, 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 and, and when people get scared, they go to the rule book, right? You know? Yeah, Chris, but also like the, the way of, you know, my lead, leading was completely different. You know, if you put the interests of your team members, you know, into your heart as well, that's when you become successful. And then being as a leader, you also should be able to lead from the front, you know, when, when there's a time and you should be able to know when to step back exactly. And it's all about the bigger picture, you know. So like just to give you an example, all, all my team members who climb normally, if, if people are climbing Everest, they would take someone who has climbed Everest before. If, let's say K2, someone who has climbed before because he knows the route and all that. But I didn't do that. I kind of you know, put my team members into a completely different new mountain. So it was something for them as well. Yes, we didn't need the route, but, you know, I was pretty much content with the ability um, of making it to the summit. But when there is like, you know, the interest of, you know, the other team members as well in your heart, then, you know, I think you, you become successful. Yes. 
Yeah. And it has to come from the heart. And then some some leaders, you know, they fake it. And then I had like, I learned so much, you know, throughout my whole career and all that. You know, there will be like some leaders who just want to be leader and they are like true leaders and all that. So, yeah, it's a, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and as I keep saying, if you if you really, you know, put the, the, the interest of your men, um, you know, they're working with, in your heart as well, then you, you achieve the, the bigger goals. Mm. And, and that's for any companies or any, anything else. And if you are the owner, CEO, if you just have the only interest for yourself, you, you're not going to grow massively because everything is a team there. So, you, yeah. you made a lot of people's dreams come true, Nims, and the, you know, they will be forever grateful to your, to your leadership. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and you, there's one part in your book that I really resonated with me. Which one? It, it's when you're on an expedition and you want it to work more than everybody else or you want it so bad. And it's the bit where you said you, you're always the first to wake up. And, he, and some days you just wish somebody else would, would wake up first. And yeah, be like, I did that. and as a team as well, and sometimes, you know, like, of course, that was my project. That was my reason and idea. My team members, they came to support and all that. But then everybody does not necessarily have the same drive and all that. And um, and it's so good to, you know, wake up at one o'clock when you're sleeping in a hair at the sea level in your in a comfortable in a home. But then when it's like minus 45, minus 50, you know, waking up with, you know, in that sleeping bag where, where the cold layer of snow is touching your face and all that, then you know, it takes in a half an hour to put the boot. And at some point I was just expecting, you know, come on guys, you know, at least somebody like wake me up, you know, in a, in a, at this stage of the project, you know, we've been so far now, you know, and I was just like making the joke out of them, like, come on lads, you know, Please, please, I would be so happy if somebody put an alarm before I just say, hey, Nims, come on, let's go. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, I have to be only, you know, always that person to, to do that. But, hey, hey, it's all right, you know. Uh, you know, I have the, you know, the Gurkha in Special Forces training about being the discipline and all that. Whereas, you know, my team members, you know, not necessarily, they came, they came from that background. So, yeah. And how is it when you go back to Nepal now? Um, I'm thinking about Sherpa Tenzing. He, 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 I mean, he was such a national hero, wasn't he? And it, it affected him quite a lot. Um, yeah, it's good, I think. And to be honest, you know, I, I think I just got awarded a, a presidential um, president's medal as well in Nepal. Um, but I think it's, it's a different way, but not necessarily either good or bad. But, you know, I think... When I was no one, when I had no money and all that, you know, no, nobody kind of came to help. Um, but then now, obviously, you know, I can, I can go and stay free in five-star hotel and I can go and do all that. And, and I have that luxury. It's, it's good to have that. But I was like, I wish I had that when I was, you know, when I was no one. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, you have to earn your respect as well, you know. Um, so, Yeah. It's like egg or chicken, but hey, hey. but I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm always happy to, you know, go back over there. You know, it was, you know, of course, I was, that's where I was born. My dad is still in Nepal. Um, and then, and obviously my, uh, my brother, Jit, and, and his family. So, and a lot of my team, well, all my team members are there. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a family. Good. And um, what's your next project? You're, you're going to be sick of people asking you this. Oh, Chris, you know, I, I cannot you know, announce that. I, it's a very sacred, buddy. Uh, but you know, it's going to be something massive and equally big and all that. Um, so, yeah. Let's hey, it's not, it's not Celebrity Big Brother, is it? <laughs> I think I, may, I might win that, you know. I'm, <laughs> I think you'd win that hands down. <laughs> if there's one thing the British public like, it's a humble, nice person. And, 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 uh, and this is my guest today, folks. Yeah, well, well but also, like, if you're too, it's, it's a soul, man. You know, people will be like, people would be bored. So you just have to like bring your different character, but I, I have got different characters, you know, learn from me in special forces, you know, where you got to disguise and all that. So it's okay. Are you going <laughs> to bring a dog there? Okay, sorry. No, it's okay. Are you going, going to announce your project soon or is it 
just um, wait. Yeah, it, it depends, buddy. You know, it's, you know, I have the purpose. You know, I, in everything what I do in bigger in my life, I need a purpose. I need a big purpose to do these bigger goals. I have a purpose now. So yeah, let's wait and see. Yes, good. So finally, Nims, um, what was it like? The last peak was, was Shishipangma, right? Yes. What was it like to summit? Um, what, was your, what was your feeling? I think, um, you know, when I was the, the most, I still remember, you know, like my, my happiest moment was never on the summit. You know, like for me, uh, it's, in relation to Shishapangma, um I was going from camp two and I knew I was, I knew it was given. We completely opened the new route there as well. But I know in the process of that, I just had like notional tears coming through my, my eyes. And, um, but the most happiest part was when I finished that project, you know, my mom came to, to pick me up. Uh, and, um, uh, and when we arrived in Kathmandu, there was a massive, you know, welcome home program. I had never seen like this, buddy, like, there was so much media and it was like, I only see that, you know, when like David Beckham's arriving in, in, in Kathmandu and every like in a newspaper, like it does, uh, you know, like, you know, reporters were fighting to have an interview and all that. So I was like, <laughs> oh my God. Um, and there was a band and, um, and my mom saw that. And um, obviously my mom had doubted my project before and all that. But then when she saw everything and all that, she was just really happy. And, and I was, I was just happy to see her happy, mate. So that, that's the highlight of the trip. And how, how is your mom's health now? Because she, she was having operations. Um, yeah. And you obviously had that worry in your mind when you're tackling these mountains. Yeah, man. Unfortunately, you know, I lost her in, in February. So she's no more with us. Um, she, oh, I didn't know that. So, yeah. Are you okay? I'm okay, buddy. I'm okay. Hey, well, cool. you're, you're, you're a survivor, that's, that's for sure. Mm. Now, the last thing I want to uh, ask you, Nims, is um, what, what is your message for, for the young people out there? What... what what can we be saying to them? Well, um, believe in yourself. Believe in, in your vision. Do not let anybody tell you that you cannot do things, that you are impossible, because only you know yourself better. No one can make that decision for you. So if you believe in something, put your heart, your mind, and your soul, dedication, work hard into it, and you will be successful. Brilliant. What a great point to end the podcast. Nims, just, just stay on the line so I can say a proper goodbye to you afterwards. But thank you so thank much um, on behalf of everybody, on behalf of the brotherhood, on, 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 on behalf of people that are, that are struggling and need a, need a visionary. Uh, and on behalf of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast, thank you so much. Um, I hope you'll come back and tell us how the book launch is going and how um how your next adventure is going to pan out and to everybody at home massive love to you all um i hope you've enjoyed this as much as i have if you could like and subscribe that's going to help and we'll see you next time all right buddy see you see, see you all and, and thank you so much for listening to this guys you have a great day nimstai thank you thank you brother